الحمدللہ الحمد للہ وقفا وسلام علیہ عباد الزین استفیٰ اما بعد فاعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وقد رب کا اللہ تعبد اللہ یاہ و بل والدین احسان سبحان رب کا رب العزت اما یصفون سلام علی المرسلین والحمد للہ رب العالمین اللہم صلی علی سیدنا محمد و علی آل سیدنا محمد و بارک و سلم اللہم صلی علی سیدنا محمد و علی آل سیدنا محمد و بارک و سلم اللہم صلی علی سیدنا محمد و علی آل سیدنا محمد و بارک و سلم رب یسر ولا تو اثر و تمم بالخیر و بکن استحین ربی زدنی علما یا فتح یا فتح یا فتح الحمد للہ فقیر صف اللہ صبح تعالیٰ وی آر بیک ان آر گیدرنگ آن اے ویری بلیسڈ نائٹ دا نائٹ دیٹ کوڈ پروبیبلی بی دا ففٹینتھ آف شاہبان اینڈ اٹ موسٹ سرٹنلی از ففٹینتھ آف شاہبان ان سم پارٹس آف دا ورلڈ سو دا بلیسنگز آف اللہ صبح تعالیٰ آر اسپریڈ نن دا لیس اٹ از اے نائٹ آف شاہبان اینڈ اے بلیسڈ منتھ a month whose blessings we discussed and spoke about at length in a recent session. And more importantly, we are now entering the zone which is perhaps the final zone before the start of Ramadan as well. An exercise that we started with the start of Rajab, our attempt to prepare and be ready for Ramadan is now accumulating in its final few sessions. I think The time that we have left, we will have one more session, inshallah, uh, before the start of Ramadan. Uh, so the next Tuesday would probably be our last session. In the recent sessions, the last two to three sessions, we have narrowed our discussion down to discussing what are the things that we need to do to preserve the new that comes in the month of Ramadan. And the ultimate objective and goal is that we, preserve, we preserve this noor in our heart because this noor will inshallah then help us elevate our spirituality to an extent where we can become a person of taqwa. Our goal is to meet the objective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for Ramadan which is la'allakum tattakun. We started with the understanding of what is it mean to be the person of taqwa and we then started looking at it that what are the things that help us preserve the noor which then leads us to becoming a person of taqwa in that we went into understanding that there are things which actually come and act as a as a leakage of that noor so we need to we need started looking at those things that what is it that we should stop from you know or, the, or what we should pre- prevent ourselves that would take that noor away from our hearts and in that we were looking at two things we were looking at the sins which are outwards and the sins which are inwards and we started this the entire discussion around sins with the eye of quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that leave the sins which are outward and those which are inwards In the outward sins, we talked about that there are two categories, categories which are related to the things which we have been asked to do, but we don't do. And in that we spoke about our Salah. And then we looked at the things which we have been asked not to do, but we still do them. And in looking at those sins which we have been asked not to do and we still do them, we realize that these are actually, there are certain windows to our heart. And when we do things which we are not meant to do, we do them from certain organs of our body part which act as a window to our heart and they bring blackness onto our heart. And therefore we spoke about last week, if you missed it, we spoke about how do ears come into play, eyes come into play, our tongues come into play, the stomachs come into play, our hands and feet come into play and what is it? that we need to do with each of these organs to ensure that these windows are closed and sealed and they do not bring blackness onto our heart. One of the most important takeaway from the last session, and I'll repeat it, 
I'll only repeat it. I will not do a quiz that who has already implemented it. But I'll only repeat it to say that get off the internet. Quit your social medias. Quit your... Right? <laughs> quit the Instagrams, Twitters, internet of choice. Anything which is internet of choice, newspapers, anything. Because that is the most common source of not protecting our eyes but nazri ke sabse common waja and at the same time a lot of time wastage it brings a heap of you know dust on our hearts which we can easily do without in if nothing else a ghibat when we do when we talk about backbiting backbiting is not just that we say things even if we are reading something which somebody else has written that is also you know a mode of backbiting so why why indulge you know especially my advice to all those who care about preserving their ramadan this ramadan stay away from all the political activities that is happening in pakistan and that will be at its peak in this ramadan because right after ramadan is going to be elections because we throw a lot of heap heaps and heaps of mud on others during the political campaigns and it's all ghibat it's all ghibat you know pe- people say that you know that politician is so and so and he is this and this if i reflect from a perspective of hadith i believe that politicians have a very high chance of you know inshallah they are people of iman at the end they have a very high chance of coming out completely clean reason being because on that day people would be questioned for what they have done so i'll share with you a hadith and this hadith will clear you know make the point very clear rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he asked sahaba ikram that who is mazloom who is muflis and who is mazloom so sahaba radhiyallahu anhu started saying that so and so person so and so person so said rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no So he says, Ya Allah, Ya Rasulullah, explain to us who is Muslim, uh, Muslim and who is Muflis. Uh, he said, he would be a person who is Muflis, not Muslim, who is Muflis. Uh, so he said, he would be a person who would come to, on the Day of Judgment, with mountains of good deeds. He would have so many good deeds that it would be as though they are, you know, it's like a mountain stacked up. so many good deeds and then when his deeds would be reviewed there would be number of people that he would have offended through backbiting through you know some other means by hurting them by being rude to them by cheating them by saying something about them which has hurt them one way or the other he would have hurt them so now all those people whose rights he has violated they would come and they would ask for justice and the way he would have to pay them off would be by giving his good deeds to them so he would start giving his good deeds to them till a point comes where there would be no more good deeds left to be given so now those people who are still left whose rights he has violated they would start putting off their bad deeds onto him and then eventually would come a point where he would now have a mountain heap of bad deeds and at that point in time it would be said that take him into jahannam so this would be a muflis person so a politician who's backbiting we are too eager to do on on whom we are too keen to accuse things without any proof without any knowledge he would come and ask for justification on that day he would when we would have to give some justification and if he have would have none we would have to give our good deeds my sheikh always says that you know when you say something about anyone a politician or anyone always ask yourself this question that if i am asked to justify this comment of mine about him would i be able to do that on the day of judgment or not and when you can't then just stay quiet so please preserve this noor and this noor gets you know leaked very 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 quickly when we do all of these things and especially when we you know 
not take care of our eyes, take care of our tongues, take care of our ears and all that. But there is one more dimension which has a very negative impact on what we want to achieve from the month of Ramadan. And that is related to our inward sins. The sins which are within us. Which if I am to say in another word is a spiritual disease as well. So one is the outward things that we do, the wrongs that we do which are going against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other is the intrinsic diseases that we have from within us which we don't even realize is a disease. The problem with these inner diseases is that when we do the outward sins, they just stop us from attaining a certain level. They don't discard us from benefiting from it, meaning to say that the noor would still come, but it would get leaked, right? Because there would be a hole because of the sin that we have done. But noor would still come. But these inner diseases, they are so, so, so harmful that they don't even make us get the new. They don't. They make. They disqualify us to an extent that we are not even worthy of attaining the new of the month of Ramadan. And hence, it is very, very, very important to a be mindful of what they are, and b do something about them before the month of Ramadan. They are our spiritual diseases. They are the diseases that we carry in our heart. And they are the cancers which spread within us. And they are to do with, if I am to name them, they are arrogance, they are jealousy, they are malice, they are hatred, they are stinginess, they are uh, being miser, they are you know, being <clears throat> envious of others. And the common factor in all of these things, if I were to draw a bottom line which all of these resides on, is a big ego. Me. Hmm? All of them link up onto that. Why am I saying that this disqualifies us all together? Is because Rasulullah he once explained at length to Sahaba Ikram Radhi as to the benefits of Ramadan and he said that in the month of Ramadan there is a night where Jibreel along with the forces of angels they descend down and it's a long hadith but the summary of it is that the angels go and they meet people and they give them, they, they say Ameen to the du'as that those people are making and they give them glad tidings of forgiveness and they, you know, they ex, you know the, the, the statuses are elevated, their spiritual strength is fortified, all of those things take place. And then in the end, when it is Fajr time, the angels gather back and then, you know, the last part of this hadith Rasulullah says that all of that greatness that happens to the Sahaba, uh, to the people who benefit from that night of Ramadan, <coughs> there are four people who are deprived of it. There are four people who are deprived from it. So the Sahaba Ikram were very keen to know that what, who are those four people who are deprived from such a blessed night. Rasulullah said that the four people who are deprived from it is number one is a person who is addicted to alcohol. Number two is a person who is disobedient to his parents. Number three is a person who has cut his family ties. And number four is a person who has malice or grudge in his heart. Kina ya boz. So these four things, they are all to do with our inner state you don't nobody from looking at your state there nothing there by hardly anything physical to with with this this is a lot to do with the inner state 
and hence why today I want to focus on after talking about the outward sense I want to talk about the inward sense in another hadith just to you know to link these two things up that how critical they are and and what great loss there is to if we stay deprived from the blessings of month of Ramadan pay attention to this hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said that he didn't say in fact he was once walking on to the uh, member of, of to offer the uh, khutbah of Jumma, and as he took the first step he said Ameen and as he took the second step he said Ameen and he took the third step he said Ameen so and then he went on and he gave the khutbah when he came down the Sahaba Ikram ta'ala anhu, uh, he, they asked that Ya Rasulullah is this something a new order has come that now when you have to you know, take the steps you would be saying Ameen he said no something different happened today today when I was about to climb Jibrail salam said came and he made a dua and he asked me to say Ameen to that dua so Sahaba Ikram said that Ya Rasulullah what was the du'as that you were uh, he made and what did you say Ameen to so he said that the first du'a he made was that cursed be the person who finds the month of Ramadan and does not use it to gain his forgiveness and Jibrail Ameen made this du'a and Rasulullah said Ameen to it the next step Jibrail alayhi salam, he made the dua that cursed be the person who finds his parents in their old age and does not use it to gain his forgiveness. And Rasulullah said, Ameen to it. And the third one was that cursed be the person in front of whom the name of Rasulullah is taken and he does not offer his salawat on Rasulullah. So, this is a very very serious matter this is Jibrail alayhi salam not an ordinary angel if a dua was to be made by any ordinary angel even then that would have been a very important dua but this is a dua that is being made by Jibrail alayhi salam the head angel and Ameen on that is being said by Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi the best of the best of the best so there is no doubt in this dua being accepted and the dua is putting the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on three people whose Ramzan go to waste whose parents that they can't take care of or who do not have the adab of Rasulullah so if we are to remain deprived despite all the fasting despite all the taraweez despite all the efforts that we put in and yet we are to stay deprived from the blessing of the Ramadan because we have these inner diseases then it's a it's a big 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 loss it's a big loss hence we must understand what these three three of these major issues are and how do we address them Alhamdulillah I say three because I believe that by grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we would be safe from the habit of being addicted to alcohol having said that there is another addiction that we all carry and that is the addiction of what I call the thumb problem you know we have this addiction of you know just till we are not scrolling down on our screens and getting the next update we feel something is missing in our eyes and, and it, it is very very once you are too used to it's so integrated in our lives that we, we feel that there is something missing when it's not there we need to not be addicted to our screens as well but I think I've spoken a lot about that as is so I'll, I'll skip this part and I'll come to the other three things which are very critical of that number one being Kina and Bogus, which is translated mostly as uh, malice and grudge, right? This disease is purely born out of when we think that our rights have been violated. 
and we think that our rights are violated because we think too high of ourselves. So if somebody gets something and we don't get it, we start saying, why did he end up getting it or she end up getting it and I didn't, I would have been more deserving of it. When somebody does something to us, we say that how dare he has done this to me, you know, I didn't deserve to be done, treated like this. The point is that if we accept the fact that whatever happens to me, happens to me only by will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will never ever hold any individual responsible for what happens to us. Because that person has not done this to us out of his own free will. He has done it because Allah allowed it to happen to me and he became a mean of happiness. What he does is his, he is answerable to what he, and between him and Allah he has to answer. But what has happened to me has happened to me because Allah wanted that to happen to me and he just became or she just became a source of that happening to me. And the other point is, is that Allah knows what I'm supposed to get and what I'm not supposed to get and what is what holds khair for me. If we understand these two points, it becomes very, very, very easy not to have grudge against anyone. Because then we would never be holding any individual responsible for what has happened to us. And because we can't hold Allah responsible for what happens to us, the only option left with us would be to be razi with what has happened to us. And that is what we need to attain. We need to get from holding others responsible and then holding a grudge against them to a point where we are content with what has happened to us because Allah wanted that to happen to me. And even if that means us getting humiliated in the middle of the street with everybody watching. It's very easy to say this, very hard for it to really get down. But the bottom line is that if Allah didn't want us to experience that zillat, nobody would have had the possibility of holding us, you know, putting us to that embarrassment. Holding a grudge against a person is considered one of the major sins. It is something that certainly deprives the person, as I've already mentioned, from the blessings of Ramadan. It also deprives the person from the blessings of the nights like tonight. So, so we, it is not worth keeping these grudges. It's not worth, you know, holding those. And I tell you where these grudges mostly are. These grudges aren't really with so and so colleague of mine who worked with me in X company. Some people even have those grudges. But these grudges are mostly with my mother in law did this to me. My father in law did this to me. You know, it's it's in my brother in law, my sister. It's in those Rishtadariya where we usually have these grudges. And somehow we are not willing to let go of those grudges. But they're not worth it. If you realize what they do to us, if you realize how much they take away from us, they are not worth it. We are better off keeping our heart clean. We are better off keeping, just cleaning everything from our heart, forgiving everyone and hoping from Allah that, you know, in return, I will be forgiven. When we forgive people in this dunya, Allah will forgive us in Akhirah. That is worth every single bit. At times people say, I'm not going to forgive you. I will hold you accountable on the day of judgment. Just reflect on this statement. Would we have, I mean, we are so perfect that we will have on that day of judgment. We will have so much senses that, you know, I have to hold this accountable. On that day, we would not even know, you know, where to, what to do. If by forgiving somebody on in this dunya, we get forgiven on that day, that is uh, the ultimate bonus that we can get. That is the ultimate bonus that we can get. We must forgive. We must forgive. There was once a Sahabi, he walked in and Rasulullah looked at that Sahabi and he said that a person of Jannah has walked in. So the other Sahabi, he was very curious to know now what is it so special about this Sahabi that Rasulullah said that this is a person of Jannah. 
So he said to him that Rasulullah, I want to, you know, he said to that Sahabi, that, oh brother, I want to spend three days, three nights with you. I want to just be with you. So he said, okay, just be with me. So he stayed three days, three nights with him, keenly observing that what extra does he do that makes him a person of Jannah. And after three days, he said to him, like, look, I saw you, you know, and observed you day and night, and I see there's nothing extra you do. You know, you pray, you, you know, do the tasbihah, the zikr, the nawafil, whatever you do, but there's nothing over and above. So, but this is what Rasulullah said about you. What is it that makes you so special? He said, I don't see anything special in me. But what I can only think of is that before going to sleep every night, I clear my heart for all everyone. I forgive everyone and I clear my heart from everyone. And this quality of his made him a person of Jannah. Rasulullah said that the one who forgives the other person in this dunya, he would be like this, like two fingers together with me on the day of judgment. We make so much dua that Ya Allah put us in the company of Rasulullah Please allow us to be with him without making any dua, without, with, just on the guarantee of Rasulullah that just by forgiving everybody, we will be like this. And what does it mean to forgive? Does it mean that I just say I forgive and the next time I see that person? <laughs> That's not forgiving. Forgiving is that now, even though that we still feel that pinch in our heart, because we are humans at the end of the day, we will, we now go up and go and say salam to him. Salam is the best nullifier of these feelings. The best. Go say salam to them. Initiate the salam. Initiate the salam. Afshus salam. Afshus salam. Rasulullah said that you will not enter Jannah till you have love between yourselves. And should I tell you something that will increase love within you? Sahaba said, what is it, Ya Rasulullah? Rasulullah said, initiate salam. Initiate salam. Say salam to each other. Give presence to the other person. It's very hard. When you do not like that person, you still go and spend your money, buy a present, give it to that person. It's hard. But this neutralizes the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us this, that if there is somebody whom you have a hard feeling with, then be nice to that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that by being nice to that person, it may so become that that person may become one of your best friends. So, objective is to neutralize this hatred by first clearing our heart and then by extending love and not just saying that, you know, I've cleared it, but I don't want to see that person. You know, There's a statement that you not we have to overcome because or when, when we are still saying that and this is happening or that is happening, that means that we haven't forgiven. That means that that complete effect has not yet taken place. The second thing that we need to take care of is the relationships which are blood relationships. And in these blood relationships, it starts with our siblings, then goes on to our mamus, chachas, puppos, and then their offsprings, our cousins, first cousins, second cousins, and so on and so forth. We are not allowed to cut off our relationships under any circumstances, except when that relationship is forcing us to do something against the Sharia. Only at that point in time, we can cut off that relationship, but even at that point in time, still, we are not meant to be rude or have ill feelings for that other person. It's just that because that person is forcing you to do something against the Sharia, therefore you, you know, do not pursue that relationship. Rasulullah said that the one who does zulm and the one who cuts off relationship, he is most deserving that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should punish him in this dunya and the punishment for him in the hereafter will remain. So this is one of those things that draw the 
punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya itself. In other hadith, Rasulullah s.a.w. said that in terms of doing good deeds, the thing that draws the most mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being nice to the people, is to fulfill the blood relationships and the thing that is worse in in, in terms of the deeds done in this dunya is zulm and to cut off blood relationships. Now, from a practical, I spoke at length about the other disadvantages of cutting off relationships, but from a practical perspective, what is it that we can do from blood relationship, uh, maintaining the blood relationship? Or what does it mean to have blood relationships? Are we supposed to make a phone call to somebody every three days and then find out how everybody is? What is it that we're supposed to do? Well, first thing is that we should not be on knowingly, intentionally on not talking terms with anyone. So we should not have declared war with somebody. We should not have court cases lingering with our brothers or sisters. And unfortunately it happens. It happens a lot. It shouldn't be happening. And this is where all those things about forgiving comes into play that we spoke about a while back. That if, again, Remember that if you let go to Rasulullah the person who is a truly a champion is the one who lets go of his rights despite being on the right. And again, a person who lets go of his rights despite being on the right gains a birthplace next to Rasulullah on in, on the day of Jannah. So the trade-off is too good to be true. Once. Rasulullah was giving the importance of maintaining the blood ties and a sahabi came and he said that but that person so and so he cuts off his ties with me I've tried to maintain him but he cuts it off he's hard, he's this, he's that Rasulullah said that if you think about and I'm paraphrasing if you think about the ajr that you get of doing this it is worth the effort and Sila Rahmi is that we join those who break from us. So if there is somebody in our family who doesn't want, yes, it doesn't mean that we are literally <laughs> It doesn't mean that as well. <laughs> but it means that from our side, the doors are always open. You are more than welcome. And at the same time, we are genuinely concerned about them so that if, God forbid, they ever go into a state where they are in trouble, health-wise, wealth-wise, or any other reasons, we are there to hold their hand. We are there to take care of them. We are there to extend our support to them. All of this is Sila Rahimi. It doesn't mean that you have to speak to somebody, but if that A, that you are not you know, upset to a point that you are not on talking terms altogether and B, you are connected enough to know how the other person is and if ever the other person is not well then you are there to support them and that they always they should know that they are that from your end you're they're always welcome they're always welcome right and then as far as your brothers and sisters your blood blood relationships are concerned then to take their children as your own children to take care of their needs as your own needs, to look out for them, to be there for them, to be to advise them, and if ever required, to support them as though you would to do so for your own family. This is these are important things as far as the blood relationships are concerned. It's easy these days if you have family groups on your WhatsApps and everything. This is where I do encourage so use of social media so there is some benefit of it it's good to just you know say salam to everyone wish everyone and just just as a means of expressing your gratitude to them and just saying hello to them now the third thing to keep the story simple and short that is a nullifier is being disobedient to our parents and i want to say something over here which may be a bit hard to digest is that when we whenever we talk about 
parents we only think of our mother and our father and we just limit it over there actually parents do include your in-laws as well your in-laws are also your parents your mother-in-law your father-in-law they are also your parent yes they are not your biological parents but in comes of the respect level their respect is no less their respect is no less if we keep on having that line of division that this is your parents and this is my parents you will never become a joint family that family cohesion and unit will never come together it has to be that these are our parents and we are duty bound to respect them as we are to respect our biological parents it has to be like that uh, if and only we develop that mindset can we have harmony in multiple phases of our lives and again as parents we should also not be distinguishing between that this is my daughter in law and this is my daughter so you know that in law part has to go away because if it doesn't go away we are not going to achieve what the sharia demands of us a lot of issues these days are because the son is pitched between the mother and the wife and the both are have their own flaws the mother are also you know i don't want to go into those debates right now but if we if we do not have, you know if we if we start treating our daughter in laws as our daughters and if i start treating our mother in laws as our mother and as even as men if we start te- treating our in laws as our parents a lot of these issues will go away there are some questions that are coming up let me take those questions up because somebody is asked repeatedly sending questions okay so if i start reading it was a lengthy question so hold your questions and i'll come back to them please sorry what does it mean to respect the parents the wording that comes in quran and the ayah that i recited earlier on as well actually it makes it very very clear that you know what is the status that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put for the parents وَقَدَا رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا That your Allah, your Rabb has ordered you that do not worship anyone except Him. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to ensure that there is no shirk. And right after that, with wow as a joiner, and those of you who have studied arabic know that when the wow comes as a joiner that means that the two are at the same level it's to be the significance of them is the same wa bil walidain ihsan in other words do not do shirk and take care of your parents that's the level of importance that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to it and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala builds up on to it that how do you take care of them that fala takul lahuma uff that do not even say uff to them you know and this it this aya amazes me so much that the expression that we come up whenever we are frustrated is uff and that frustration and this is a first, the least level of disrespect when we are showing to anyone you know and i've notice this myself that you know with even with my own parents at times you know when they are saying something like uff kya kar rahe you know like even as that this word uff as an expression and i am in my mind saying this in a very jokingly manner in a very lovingly manner and there's not even an iota of disrespect in my mind that i'm trying to show to my parents yet the expression that is coming out is uff and when you are and when i reflect on how my children are at their age 10 under you know when you tell them to do something their first frustration is oh you know like that it's like uff kya kaam de diya you know like we don't want to do this it's not that they want to disrespect but it's they realize that it's heavy on 
them and they have to do something which they don't want to do. So this oof basically nubs it in the bud. Say that when something comes to you, in other words, it's saying is that nothing that your parents says to you should be heavy on you. Nothing that they say to you should be heavy on you. Everything should be readily accepted. It's a big thing. It's not a simple task. It's not simple at all. But this is Quran. فَلَا تَكُلَّهُمَا And then it builds up. Because once we first say uff, and then, you know, then we start correcting them. You know, they say that when your child is young, he is, you know, obedient to you. And then once he, you know, is a bit of consciousness, then he becomes an uh, advisor to you. So he, now he has his or her input that I think we should do it like this, or it can be done better like this. And then after a while, they become an instructor to you, like, do it like this, you know, this is better for you. So this is, Quran is also taken, oof, and then the next stage is taking it to, is that now, do not even raise your voice to them. Unko jhagro bima. Do not correct them. Very, very natural to do, especially with your old parents. And this Quran is talking about in the Kalkibara Ahaduma that when they have each reached the age where they are old now. And then oh, parents are the key to Jannah. They are the key to Jannah. Living or even if they have passed away, they are the key to Jannah. How are the key to Jannah living? Because Rasulullah said that if your father is from the middle doors of the Jannah. So use this door to enter the Jannah. What does middle door mean? It means that right in the center, easiest. You don't have to take any shortcuts. A dua of a father has no barriers between him and Allah. That's how direct father's dua is. And do you know between father and mother who has the highest status in respect? Any guesses? Hmm? Mother has the highest again. Respect for the mother is above the respect of the father. Agar baab middle darwaza hai, to ma to hai jannat. And this is one thing that we don't take care of. We take it for granted while they are with us. And when they are not with us, we don't know what to do for them. Our parents, we must take care of. Bitch jai, kuch kar le, but take care of them. Very, very important. And if they have left, know that you are now their source for entering into Jannah. Live your life to such perfection because every single good deed that you would do would be a sadka jariya for them. Any good that you do goes to them. There was once a sheikh, he saw a dream and he saw that he was going to a graveyard and as he passed that graveyard, he saw that everybody is rushing to come and collect some things except one person. So he found out what is happening. He said that, uh, you know, these are the peoples of this graveyard and they are waiting to find out, all those who have gathered, they are waiting to find out that if there anybody has sent any hadiya for them. So he said, why is that person not moving? He said that that person has a son who is a Hafiz and he recites Quran every day and that automatically comes as a Hadiya for him. So he is easy. So he said, well, let me find out who this son is. So he found out that who this person was and he went and he realized that this son of his is a basically a shopkeeper. So he went to his shop and he observed that he is you know, somebody who is a half is and he's all day in his shop, whatever he is doing, he is reciting Quran. So he realized that yes, Hadiyah is going to him. After a while, he saw the dream again and he saw that now this person, along with the others, was also, you know, gathered just to see if any Hadiyah has come. So he said, What happened to him? Why is he now? So he said that because his son has now passed away. So he went to verify and he realized that yes, the son has passed away. So as long as we as the children, any good deed that we do, 
it automatically goes to our parents. So mold our lives, reshape our lives to the point that it becomes a source of sadhka for our parents. Be mindful of that. While they're alive, use them. Use them. Use them to gain du'as from them. Use them for that they pray for your maghfirat. They pray for your success in dunya and akhirah. Please them. There are five categories to being an obedient children, child. Number one is that we, when our parents say something, we you know, completely discard it. We say that, you know, Kya musibat Somebody who is like that, who is disobedient to his parents, no matter what he does, no matter what he does, otherwise, in terms of neki, there's nothing that's accepted from him. If you are a disobedient child to your parents, if you break your parents' heart, if you raise your voice on them, if you nauzubillah raise your hands on them, you can forget about gaining anything good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At a second level, if you're a child who listens to your parents, but you know, it is a great burden on you. You listen to them, but it is a great burden on you. If it is like that, then then that burden of yours, because it comes into that category of being off and you know correcting your parents, that still nullifies any good that you do afterwards. At the third level, if you are somebody who does what your parents ask you to do, but then afterwards you objectate unko ke maine aapke liye wo kaam kiya tha i did that for you i did that for you agar aap apne parents ko jatane wale hain to us waqt jo aapne neki ki hoti hai wo to mil jata hai aapko lekin uske baad it again negates any good that you have done and number 4 is that if you are somebody who listens to your parents and as they do it, that is when you are at a good shape. But the best is that the one who anticipates that what is it that will make my parents happy and does it without even them asking for it, that is the person who has really attained success as far as the parents are concerned. I don't want to take much more of the time, it's already quite late, but these three things we must 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 clear our inner selves from them before the start of ramadan to ensure that we are not among those who are outright disqualified from gaining the blessings of this month what are those three things clean your heart forgive everyone of everything clean your heart of any malice of any hatred of any grudge that we may have for anyone, for whatever reason. No matter what they have done, forgive them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight, think of all those, take out that little book that we carry in our hearts, strike out all the names, turn away that page and just throw it forever. Take it out from our books, forgive everyone. Number two, reflect, think that who is it that we are not on talking terms within our families. If there are such relationships, initiate and say sorry. Even if you are not at fault, even if they are 100% at fault, say something to say that let's tie up again. You would have done your part by initiating that conversation. If there is no reciprocation, then it's not on you. But initiate that. Number three is invest in this gold mine, which is your parents. Invest in them. <coughs> invest in them. In whatever way possible, invest in them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to do all of these things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from. We'll take those questions, but now Hazrat Bayan has started. So we'll switch to Hazrat Bayan and then we'll take the questions after. Bible, Hak, Nedas. Is Nikai going on? Salke Paramai. 
کرم کا مہینہ مجاہرے کا مہینہ سیدنا اسماعیل علیہ السلام کی قربانی بھی محرم میں ہوئی اور سیدنا حسین رجلانو کی قربانی میں دی تو محرم کا مہینہ مجاہرے کا مہینہ لہجہ کا مہینہ اللہ کے مشاہدے سال کی ابتدا مجاہدے سے اور سال کی انتظا مشاہدے پہ پھر اس میں جو درمیان کا مہینہ ہے نا وہ بنتا ہے رجب کا مہینہ انسانیت کی میراج کا مہینہ ہے میرے ساتھ و سام کو رجب میں میراج مسئلہ اب کے دو حصے بنے ششما یا بن پہلی ششما ہی میں اللہ نے ربیع الاول سے اس کو زینت رحمت اللہ العالمین تشریف لے آئے اور دوسری شہی کو اللہ نے رمضان سے زینت اللہ کا قرآن ترتیب یہ بنے گی سال کی ابتدا مجاہدے سے اور سال کی انتہا مشاہدے پہ درمیان کے حصے میں اللہ نے معراج عطا فرمائی پھر پہلی شش ماہی میں اللہ نے رحمت اللہ العالمین کو بھیجا کائنات کے لیے رحمت شش ماہی میں اللہ نے رمضان کو بھیجا جو پوری انسانیت کے لیے رحمت کا یہ بڑے اہم ہے رجب شعبان ریشم وارکا میں آتا ہے کہ جب رجب شروع ہوتا تھا تو نبی اسلام دعا مانگتے تھے اللہ بارک لنا فی رجب و شعبان و بلغنا اے اللہ رجب اور شعبان میں برکت عطا فرما اور ہمیں پتر نہ تک بیب صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اس مہینے کا انتظار کرتے تھے وش کرتے تھے کہ اے اللہ رجب اور شعبان میں برکت عطا فرما اور ہمیں رمضان تک پہنچا علیف علماء نے جانے کے لیے بال نے کہا کہ رجب کا مہینہ انگریزی کا مہینہ ہے اور شعبان کا مہینہ آپ پاشی کا مہینہ اور رمضان کا مہینہ فصل کاٹنے کا مہینہ جو نیکی وزل ہم کاٹیں گے اس کا اجر ہم میں عطا فرمائیں بعض نے کہا کہ رجب کا مہینہ پتے نکلنے کا مہینہ شعبان کا مہینہ پھل لگنے کا اور رمضان کا مہینہ پھل کاٹنے کا مہینہ بعض نے اس کو اس انداز سے سمجھایا کہ رجب کا مہینہ رحمت کی ہوا چلنے کا شعبان کا مہینہ اور بادل آنے کا مہینہ اور رمضان کا مہینہ رحمتوں کی بارش ہونے کا رجب کا مہینہ مال کی پاکی کا مہینہ شعبان کا مہینہ بدن کی پاکی رمضان کا مہینہ قلب کی پاکی کا مہمان کو عمل پر ستر گنا اجر ملتا ہے شعبان میں سات سو گنا ملتا ہے اور رمضان میں بندے کو ہزار گنا اجر نبی علیہ السلام سامی کا شمار کا میں بات کو ایسے سمجھایا فرمایا کہ رجب کا مہینہ اللہ کا مہینہ غریبوں کو زکوٰۃ ملتی ہے نا تو فرمایا یہ اللہ تم اللہ کے لیے دیتے ہو اور فرمایا کہ شعبان کا مہینہ میرا مہینہ شعبان کے مہینے نبی علیہ السلام سامنے اپنے ساتھ نسبت یہ میرا مہینہ ہے اور فرمایا کہ رمضان کا مہینہ میرے